right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 485, Revive Us Again, 485. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thank the glory. Revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for Thy Spirit of light, who has shown us our Savior and scattered our night. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Hallelujah, Amen. Hallelujah, Thine the glory. Revive us again. All glory and praise to the Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our sins and has cleansed every stain. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thine the glory. Revive us again. Revive us again, fill each heart with thy love. May each soul be rekindled with fire from above. Hallelujah, by the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, by the glory. Revive us again. All right, for our scripture reading in Jeremiah, let's turn to Jeremiah chapter 29, and I'll read from verse 1 down to verse 14. And here we have a letter that the Lord directed Jeremiah to write to the captives in Babylon, in other words, those that initially when Nebuchadnezzar came down, he took them captive, of which Ezekiel would have been in that first number. There were three different times when Nebuchadnezzar came down into the land, and each time took out captives, and it was the third time that he came down and destroyed Jerusalem, and that had not yet happened here. Jeremiah was still in Jerusalem at this time prophesying, but the time was close, according to God's purpose, that he would take out that city. So verses 1 to 4, we read, Now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem unto the residue of the elders, the word residue is the remnant, which were carried away captives, and to the priests, and to the prophets, and to all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Typically our thinking is, well, he came down and took them all and scattered them, but they still, in captivity, gathered together as a Jewish community. And there were, as the Lord purposed, even in captivity, elders and priests, and it says they're prophets. Sometimes you think, well, it's just Jeremiah, but there were others that the Lord had raised up that even in captivity continued to instruct the people according to the word of the Lord. It says after that, Jeconiah the king and the queen and the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem and the carpenters and the smiths, were departed from Jerusalem by the hand of Elasa, the son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, the son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent 
unto Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. So here, this was sent by the hand of these that were to carry this official letter from Jeremiah to these that were in Babylon. This reminds us here, because even though Jeremiah did not actually preach this to them, yet the written word was God's word. I'm reminded of that even with regard to what we're reading right now. This was God's word to those that were in captivity in his day. And you can look around and think, well, we're captives in some way today, even with all the influences of this world and politics and everything that is contrary to the word of God. Here we are, but we still have a word from the Lord. And so perhaps this surprises us a little bit in reading what the word was. He basically is telling those in captivity, go ahead and make yourself comfortable. It's going to be a while. This was in contrast to what some false prophets had been saying that don't worry, it's going to be a short captivity and within two years, as we saw last time, everybody's going to be back. Here, Jeremiah said, build ye houses. So when you think of captivity, again, don't think that they were in bondage and chains and they were in these communities. That's the way Nebuchadnezzar did it. Took, took them out of their homeland, brought them into their land, but gave them the authority to be able to continue to meet together in their communities. Build ye houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. Think about planting and eating. It's going to be times and seasons here. He says, take ye wives and beget sons and daughters. And give your daughters to husbands that they may bear sons and daughters that ye may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray unto the Lord for it. For in the peace thereof shall ye have peace. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your prophets and your diviners, he's talking about the false prophets, that be in the midst of you deceive you and either hearken to your dreams which he caused to be dreamed, for they prophesy falsely unto you in my name. I have not sent them, saith the Lord. So there was in this, even in captivity, a message for that people, that remnant, even though they weren't in the land, captivity, yet there was a word of the Lord for them. And it was that they should go ahead and build houses and dwell in them. This shows that they were in Babylon by the will of God. He's the one that carried them there. And uh, that the judgment he was bringing was really upon the land of Israel, upon Judah and the city of Jerusalem for their generations of rebellion against him. But in God's purpose, here he takes these out of that land and in that way you can see even his mercy. That in judgment, he's remembering mercy. That there's that remnant that he purposed to preserve. And so it was best for them to settle in and make the best of their lives and families there. I think about where we are today in this world with everything in turmoil and unsettled. Well, settle in, build, and plant. Enjoy the fruit of your labor. We don't know how long it's going to be, but it'll be as long as the Lord has purposed the way things are. And even here, he encourages them to have children. He says that they might be increased and not diminished. This was God's purpose, that even though he'd taken Judah out of the land, the inhabitants, yet there was that remnant that was to increase 
just like the children of Israel in Egypt. The more that Pharaoh applied his harshness as a taskmaster, the more they multiplied. God purposed that. And so, again, a reminder that even in exile, it did not mean that God had forgotten or abandon any way those that were his. And here we see something like Paul encourages Timothy to pray for those in positions of authority. And you have to remember in his day, it was Caesar, it was Nero, it was the Roman Empire. And yet he said to pray for those in authority, for kings, that we might live peaceable lives. Well, we have the same Instruction here in verse 7, to seek the peace of the city whither I have caused you to be carried away captives. Does God bless a pagan city or a pagan nation for a few of the elect's sake? Absolutely. Right now where some of you work, God is prospering those businesses. He's prospering those places. I believe he's even prospering our city in that sense to enable us to stay here and to continue to worship. If everything dried up, everybody be scattered. Now, the world or those in authority don't give God the glory for this, but I believe that this is how we pray, that God would grant a peaceable life in this city, just as he says here to them, to seek the peace of the sick, whether I have I have caused you to be carried away captives and pray on the Lord for it. Sometimes we don't know how we should pray. Well, let's pray for the peace of this city, even where we dwell, to such a degree that we are able to continue to enjoy these times of worship and the freedom that the Lord has given us, regardless of whatever the opposition is. And it says pray to the Lord for it. Capital L-O-R-D. That's who he is, the sovereign Lord God. And uh, at the same time, do not let the prophets, the false prophets or diviners who are in our midst. There were many there, there are many today. But we're not to be distracted by those that are preaching another message other than Christ and him crucified. Pray for the remnant. Pray for those that the Lord has preserved and taught by his spirit and that he would preserve us from every false way. And so, verses 10 through 14, Thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. Here again, I believe this is what Daniel was reading in the book of Daniel as those 70 years drew to a close. He started putting two and two together and realized that time was close. And that's when he began to seek the Lord and the Lord gave him that vision that we see of the kingdoms that would rise and fall all the way until the time of Christ. Here was said after 70 years be accomplished. At Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to this place. It wasn't going to cause them to return in the two years that the false prophets were saying. And that's like people today. Boy, if we just, you know, bow the knee and humble ourselves and pray that God's going to hear. They think that somehow they're praying and multiplying a word before the Lord is going to turn a situation around. No. It's according to God's determined will. This was to be 70 years. And he says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. That's just the opposite of what people like to think. Well, he knows our thoughts. No, he sure does. It's, they aren't good thoughts. But I know the thoughts that I think towards you. This is God speaking. And again, to his remnant, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. That word expected means a hopeful end. Then shall you call upon me and ye shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you. A lot of people take that out of context. They just apply it to anybody and everything. No, he's speaking here specifically to that remnant on whom he had purposed to show his favor 
and would bring back into the land after the 70 years. What we're reading about right now and studying the book of Ezra is blessing being upon them that after those 70 years, there would be the hopeful end, that temple being rebuilt, sacrifices offered again, priests offering them unto the Lord, all as a type and picture of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And ye shall seek me, verse 13, and find me, when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Again, speaking of those that were his, that did not heed the words or the counsel of the false preachers, but that sought him. And he said, I will be found of you. <laughs> That's an interesting way it's put, isn't it? That the Lord determines to be found. He's the one that gives the heart to seek and the desire to know him in truth and purposes to be found of him. It's like Paul wrote to the Romans. He was found of those who sought him not. And truly that's what we'd have to confess. But if we know anything of the Lord today, it's because he purposed that he be found of us, said the Lord. And I will turn away your captivity and I will gather you from all the nations and from all the places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord. I will bring you again into the place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. Why did he do that? Why did God purpose to bring him back? Well, again, remember Judah was that tribe from which Christ should come 500 plus years later. And uh, so it was that he purposed that that remnant remain for Christ's sake. And any blessing, any mercy that the Lord showed, certainly that's the one reason. It's for Christ's sake. Gracious Father, I thank you for your word, how simple, how profound, how plain it is when we read it exactly as you've set it forth. And I pray that as we gather for worship this evening, first of all, that we would be thankful that even with all that's going on in this nation and uh, so many that stand opposed to this word, opposed to the one true worship that you've ordained through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, yet here we are. In many ways, a remnant in captivity. And uh, you have raised up preachers that are faithful to declare the glory of your son and point sinners to him. And I pray that you would so enable me to do in our time of worship this evening that the Lord Jesus Christ, your blessed son, be glorified and honored. And I give you the thanks and praise in his precious name. Amen. All right, let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 77 and sing this, Son of My Soul, hymn number 77. Son of my soul, thou Savior dear, it is thy life if thou be here. Oh, may no earth born cloud arise to hide thee from thy servant's eyes. When the soft dews of kindly sleep, my weary eyelids gently sing. Be my last thought, how sweet to rest forever on my Savior's breast. Abide with me from morn till eve, for without thee I cannot live. Abide with me when night is nigh, for without thee I dare not die. Be near to bless me when I wake, bear through the world my way I take. Abide with me till in thy love I lose my 
myself in heaven above. Amen. May the Lord ever be with us. Let's take our Bibles and look in Ezra chapter 7. Our text today is from verse 12 down to verse 28. I want to speak with you about the God of heaven three times in this portion here in Ezra chapter 7. This is the expression that we find here and how easy it is to read over even that title of who God is. The God of heaven. But think about it. What does that mean? Well, if he's the God of heaven, that means he rules over all. I once had somebody tell me that. They said, well, I don't see the word sovereignty in the Bible. Well, you may not see that specific word, sovereignty, but you certainly see a God who is sovereign. Our God reigns over all things. And so, even here in Ezra chapter 7, as I said three times, it's mentioned, it begins in verse 12. My text, Artaxerxes, king of heaven, or king of kings, unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law, here it is, of the God of heaven. Stop and think about who's writing this. This is a pagan king. Artaxerxes was one in succession of those Medes and Persians. They were the ones that had the law that could not be altered could not be chained. You remember in Daniel when they brought a law against any that would worship any other god than the king, Darius. They sought to trap Daniel. And Darius all night long, because he was a friend to Daniel, sought a way around it, but could not, because you could not change the law. And so, even as pagan kings, they had an understanding of rule. And reign. And yet, even here, the influence of who Ezra was already to Artaxerxes, because in verse 11 it says, Now this is the copy of the letter that King Artaxerxes gave unto Ezra the priest, the scribe, even a scribe, of the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Ezra didn't immediately come back from captivity with that first group that came. He came afterward according to God's purpose. But just like Daniel had been a friend to Nebuchadnezzar and uh, was a, a man of great wisdom in Nebuchadnezzar's eyes, even so, all these years later, now with Artaxerxes, the Lord gave favor to Ezra in the eyes of Artaxerxes. And the impression, even though that he wasn't converted, yet he understood Ezra's role. You can see there in verse 12. Unto Ezra the priest, a scribe of the law of the God of heaven. So Ezra was prophet, he was priest, and then he was a judge, he was a ruler, king. So I say he's a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is not the Lord Jesus Christ priest under the God of heaven? That was his role in coming to this earth. But you see that word used there, God of heaven, in verse 12. And then as we read on in verse 23, again, this is all part of Artaxerxes' decree. So this is coming from a pagan king. He says, whatsoever is commanded, by the God of heaven. That's not just some term that we lightly read over. Even when Christ taught his disciples to pray, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. It's repeated twice there in verse 23. And then, I missed it, but in verse 21, I, even I, are exerxes the king, do make a decree 
to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra the priest, the scribe of the law of the God of heaven, shall require of you, it be done speedily. Even there we see a picture of Christ and Ezra, that all things were put into his hand to fulfill God's purpose. And so coming back here to verse 12, this is an important title. God of heaven is a name for God that states not only God's presence, because when you think about heaven, go out and look at the heavens, no matter what part of the earth you happen to be residing, you look up, there are the heavens, always present, and yet overall, we may not always be mindful that God reigns over all, and yet he does, just as the heavens are over all. Now you won't find heaven on uh, any kind of interstellar map. <laughs> Try to find heaven, whatever is called heaven, somewhere. I know the cosmonauts back in the day when they first went up, they came back and said, we went up, we didn't see God. That was a mockery. But heaven, as referred to here when it talks about the God of heaven, we're talking about not a physical domain, because God is not limited to space and time. Solomon even recognized that when he built the temple, that he was too great even to be able to dwell in a place and limited to a place. But here, more so, it is speaking of him in terms of his spiritual domain. Another way that he's referred to in Scripture is the Lord of hosts. Whatever those hosts are, whether it be the stars and the constellations, the galaxies, whether it be the spiritual realm of angels, demons. He is the God of heaven. He's the Lord of hosts. And therefore, when it speaks of him as the God of heaven, this is what distinguished him from the gods that even Artaxerxes and Nebuchadnezzar and other pagan kings did. They, they considered themselves to be gods in the eyes of the people. And they built monuments just like Nebuchadnezzar built that statue. You look at the pyramids in Egypt. These were all ways in which these kings tried to leave an imprint of their supposed immortality, and yet they're dead. If you dig in those graves, they're, they're gone. Those are bones. But the God of heaven is one that, that not only rules over all, but He's spirit. God is spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And therefore, he is everywhere. There's not anywhere where you can go and say, well, here he is. So all of these attributes of God that you can consider his sovereignty, his majesty, his omnipresence, all of these are wrapped up in this one description that we find here, the God of heaven. Now, the Hebrews, their worldview is that there were actually three spheres of heavens. The atmosphere, which is what when you look up you could see, and we can understand that. And then there's what they consider to be the stellar heaven, that might be something like these that recently went up into space and everybody's floating around and kind of feeling the you know, zero gravity and thinking, oh, how beautiful to be able to look and consider. And then they believe that there was that third heaven, which is what they consider to be God's dwelling. In scripture, sometimes you'll see the heaven of heavens, a reference to the heaven of heavens. Well, that's another way of describing God's dwelling place. It's not a physical place. In fact, you remember 
that when Paul was taken up, caught up, he didn't know whether he was dead or alive, but he refers to having been caught up into the third heaven. And he saw things that were not permitted to speak. The Lord purposed that. And so when we consider even souls that the Lord takes to heaven, that's a sphere of which we know nothing of. All we can say is it's where God dwells and not necessarily some physical place where you can go and actually with a telescope or somehow discover these souls that are there. It's, it has to do with the dwelling place of God himself. When the scriptures say that the Lord Jesus Christ came from heaven and came to this earth, it's that place where he was with the Father before the world ever existed. And he came through this earth. And then when he rose again, the scriptures say that he passed through the heavens. He passed through or above the heavens. Anything as the, as the disciples stood there and gazed as he was caught up into heaven. And the angels came and said, this same Jesus whom you've seen go away will come in like manner as you've seen him go. You say, well, there's a man in, in glory right now in heaven. There is, but he's not to be seen now with these physical eyes, but nonetheless, the reality. And so I emphasize that because everything we read here in scripture pertains to this God of heaven. And any that have a lesser view of him don't know God. That's why those that somehow think that God is acting and reacting according to what men do or don't do, they don't know God. They don't know the God of heaven. I dare say that this pagan king Artaxerxes had a better understanding, at least mentally, and a certain fear of this God that drove him to make these decrees that many today that profess to know God have no clue. They have a God that's in man's hands today and God waiting on man. I don't see anything in here where God is waiting on these to do anything. And so as we read on, he says, I make a decree, verse 13, that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem, go with me. A lot of people like to jump on that word free will. They go, there it is. They had to decide to go. No, when he's speaking here, he's talking about that he's not forcing any of them to go, but as the Lord directs them to go. He makes his people willing in the day of his power. And even Artaxerxes recognized that, that there were those that even remained behind even after these others went back to Jerusalem. But that the God of heaven would be with them. He says, for as much as thou art sent of the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem according to the law of thy God, which is in thine hand. And not only to go back, but to carry the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. That's what the work of grace in the heart does. It causes those that are objects of that grace to freely offer, to give back unto the Lord what he has already blessed you with. I have a friend that's departed now for some time, but he used to say that, that God blesses his people to give and then blesses them for giving. It's the Lord that blesses, even as here. 
that these have freely offered unto the God of Israel, whose habitation is in Jerusalem. He recognizes he's the God of heaven, and yet he makes reference to his habitation in Jerusalem, recognizing that that temple that at this point was built because that letter had already been written for them to go back and to, to give them the permission to build the temple. Now it was the building of the city. But here's a beautiful picture of the God of heaven upon earth. In other words, a picture of Christ because he is the God of heaven. And yet it says whose habitation is in Jerusalem. That temple represented Christ tabernacling among his people and all the silver and the gold that thou canst find in all the province of Babylon with the free will offering of the people and of the priests offering willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. I've had people tell me this, well, if all you do is preach the grace of God and you don't preach the law, then you're going to make people lazy. Grace of God doesn't make any lazy. Look how many times this is repeated here again by this pagan king that these offerings be willingly offered. We come unto God willingly when his grace draws us through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not a bondage. It's not a legalism. Freely we've received, freely give. That's the motivating factor in any that are the Lord's. And so we see here in these verses, the king commissioning these to go back and uh, commends Ezra. Here again, we see that Ezra wasn't just some sort of glorified secretary or copyist when it refers to him as a scribe of the law of the God of heaven, but rather prophet of the Lord and one who had been taught of the Lord himself even while in captivity as we saw in, in reading Jeremiah there were those like Ezekiel that the Lord had taken into captivity Ezra would have been one of that remnant that the Lord preserved during those 70 years and now was pleased to bring back but he was trained in the word of God taught by the spirit and so, not only did Ezra go to Jerusalem, but he was actually sent by Artaxerxes to gather information for the king and his seven counselors who volunteered to go to Jerusalem. And with this, he hoped to encourage others to go with Ezra and that they prosper. Here's a wicked king, and yet, as we saw with Jeremiah, that we pray for the prosperity of that city, that here the decree was that this people that the Lord purposed to bring back should prosper and to carry the gold and the silver with them. Artaxerxes here was authorizing the giving of many silver and gold gifts for the temple along with whatever the people or the priests should bring. And uh, that's how God purposed that the work would be established. I've often said that what God orders, he provides. And uh, we don't have to try to do his work for him somehow, thinking that we've got to come up with the means or whatever. If God's in it, it'll, it'll be there. If not, leave it alone. It's in his time. So verses 17 to 22, we see how the Lord purposed for the providing for the temple and what's particular the temple is what? The sacrifices. It's not just building a building. That thou mayest buy speedily. I love how this word is used here. I mean, with such urgency, Artaxerxes realizes he's the God of heaven. We don't, we don't dilly-dally here that thou mayest buy speedily with this money, what, bullets, rams, lambs, 
with their meat offerings and their drink offerings and offer them upon the altar, the altar, one altar, of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. If you didn't know Artaxerxes was making that decree, you'd think, well, this is one of the prophets. No, this is a pagan king that God has opened his mouth and given this decree that that temple now being built, because it had already been built at this point, should now begin again the sacrifices. And that's where that money should be. I think about what it is to worship the Lord. It's not in buildings and whatnot. Yes, it's a place to meet, but what is of value is the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, the altar. We have an altar that those which serve at the altar, that's what the writer of the Hebrews said back in his day, because Christ had already come and paid the debt, and yet the, the religious people sewed that veil back up and went right on with their animal sacrifices as if the death of Christ meant nothing. But he told them, he said, we have an altar at which those that partake of their altar cannot partake. It's different. It's not some thing down in front of a church building either where people come down front, get on their knees and somehow pray through. No. We have an altar. It's Christ, that altar. His sacrifice. That's the way in which the Lord's people have found acceptance with him. And this is what this king is encouraging. Take that money and put it toward the sacrifices and the altar. In verse 18, whatsoever shall seem good to thee and to thy brother to do with the rest of the silver and gold, that do, notice, after the will of your God. Isn't that what the Lord taught his disciples to pray? Thy will be done on earth even as it is in heaven. This is a pagan king that's accustomed to making decrees and rules and regulations, but when it comes to this people of God, do whatsoever shall seem good to thee. I've had preachers say to me, oh, I could never tell my people that. Well, that's because you're dealing with a bunch of pagans and unconverted people. You, you don't dare turn them loose because they don't know anything of grace or Christ. You're just presiding over a bunch of dead bodies. I'll tell you this, if the Lord has ever taught a sinner of Christ by his grace, I can say to that sinner, go do what seemeth good to thee. It's like the Lord. When he healed these, go your way. What shall seem good to thee and to thy brethren to do the, with the rest of the silver and gold. Whatever is given for sacrifice and worship, but whatever remains, do after the will of your God. See, that's the part right there. What is our desire? The Lord's will be done. That's not just the slogan that we pray, thy will be done, but truly, where God is directing, we're a free people. We've been freed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, therein we live and move and have our being. So, verse 19, the vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God. Notice he keeps saying of thy God, of thy God. At least he's not being a pretender as if somehow he's part of this. And yet it's the Lord that's using him. The vessels also that are given thee for the service of the house of thy God. There should be a difference between the way we worship God and the way this world worships God. Those deliver thou before the God of Jerusalem. And whatsoever more shall be needful for the house of thy God, which thou shalt have occasion to bestow, bestow it out of the king's treasure house. <laughs> He's saying, I, whatever's lacking, I'll provide it. This is why I say that that Satan doesn't have any money. Everything belongs unto the Lord. Even these kings, pagan as they were, yet 
the Lord purposed that that treasury money be used for his glory and his honor, whether they acknowledge it or not. And he says, I, even I, Artaxerxes the king, do make a decree to all the treasures which are beyond the river, that whatsoever Ezra, the priest, the scribe, or the law of the God of heaven shall require of you, it be done. There it is again, speedily. This reminds me too of when the Lord brought Israel out of Egypt, that there were Egyptians that willingly gave of their goods as they saw the Lord's hand in delivering them. The gold, the silver, what, what did Israel in the wilderness use that gold and silver to do? It was to build that tabernacle. And those the, the temple furniture, the tabernacle furniture, the altar, all of these things that the Lord used from the hand of the Egyptians. And even here, we see this with the Persians. He says, unto an hundred talents of silver, and to an hundred measures of wheat, and to an hundred baths of wine, and to an hundred baths of oil and salt without prescribing how much. In other words, he said, don't even, don't count the beans, whatever it takes. The talents in the system, and it's tough sometimes to figure out exactly what a talent would have been worth back then, but a talent actually weighed about 75 pounds. So when you're talking about 100 talents of silver, 7,500 pounds of silver, that's an enormous sum. That'd be about three and three quarters tons of silver. How on earth they carried all that back? Probably some carts and chariots, but this amount together with a talent of gold was the tribute that Pharaoh Necho imposed on Judah back in 2 Kings 23 and verse 33. If you, if you look back there in the history, and it's as if Artaxerxes knew that and that everything that had been imposed back then, if you look in 2 Kings 23, 33, by Pharaoh on Judah before taking them into captivity, now he's saying, give every bit of it back. You see, and Pharaoh Necho made Eliakim, the son of Josiah, king in the room with Josiah, his father, and turned his name to Jehoiakim and took Jehoiakim to Jehoahaz away and he came to Egypt and uh, died there. That's verse 34. Verse 33, Pharaoh Necho put him in bands at Riblah in the land of Hamath that he might not reign in Jerusalem and put the land to a tribute of a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. So it's as if the Lord directed him right down to the, all that goes back. Again, the God of heaven, down to the minutest detail. Let us never question what he does. We, we don't know one second from now what he's going to be, his purpose to do, but we can look back and see every detail. What we call prophets and law, it's all his. And uh, it's to his honor and his glory. And so, verse 23, whatsoever is commanded by, here it is, the God of heaven, let it be diligently done for the house of the God of heaven. Isn't that our prayer? Even now, we don't know how the Lord's going to be pleased to bless. I can remember when I first went to Africa in the beginnings of the work there, first I had to be taught of Christ and after that, then, as the word went forth, it just seemed like those years from 1984 to 1994, 10 years, everything was in fast motion. I couldn't keep up. I was traveling from different countries, preaching, Lord raising up different congregations and the maiden. And next thing you know, he took me out of there. And here I am now, these many years later, 
looking back, guess what? Those congregations are still there. The Lord still has these preachers there preaching the gospel. And it's a blessing for me, particularly on, on Fridays in the morning, every Friday at 10 o'clock, I get on Skype and there's a number of these preachers from different countries that we gather together and I'm still preaching and teaching for them. And they're rejoicing in this message. And there's an urgency to it. I didn't know when that began that the Lord be pleased to preserve. Same thing with coming to Shreveport back in 1995. There were some difficult days in the, the beginnings of this congregation even here in Shreveport. There's some that even mocked and said it wouldn't last. In fact, they, they sought to have me run out of town those first two years. And yet, here we are. Nice place to worship. People coming in don't even know about that original history. That's what I love about it. They come in and sit down and they just rejoice that they're hearing of Christ. But all of these things, when we pray the Lord's will be done, Verse 23, whatsoever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be diligently done. For what? The house of God, of the God of heaven. What's the house of the God of heaven today? Christ, the uh, writer of the Hebrews said that God has set, established his son over his house. <laughs> so if you don't know how to pray, well, let's, let's pray this, that the Lord diligently accomplish what he's purposed for his house. That is his people, his elect. We're not trying to pray for everybody. No, many pass by, they're, they're not given a second thought. They read the scriptures on the sign and yet they go their way. But every once in a while, the Lord will catch somebody's heart and eye. They'll think, huh, wonder what's going on in there. Come in and sit down. That's the Lord's work to do. He says, for why should there be wrath against the realm of the king and his sons? See, his motive Again, he didn't know the grace of God. He could speak of the God of heaven, but he, he was afraid of this God. He knew enough, unlike even many that profess to know him, but this pagan king knew enough that he did not want to be a subject of God's wrath and be found in any way standing against this God. And so it shows here his fear and why it was that he believed it was good for him to let's, uh, let this people go, just like with Pharaoh. It came to a point where he was ready to see them go. And then in verses 24 to 26, we see where Ezra is given that legal power to enforce God's law. And, and that's how he's a type of Christ. All authority has been put in the hands of Christ. Christ said the Father judges no man, but put all authority in his hand. Here we see that in verse 24. Also we certify you that touching any of the priests and Levites, singers, porters, nethanim, or ministers of this house of God, it shall not be lawful to impose toll, tribute, or custom upon them. And thou, Ezra, he gives this word to Ezra, after the wisdom of thy God that is in thine hand, set magistrates and judges, which may judge all the people that are beyond the river, all such as know the laws of thy God, and teach ye them that know them not. And whosoever, 26, will not do to the law of thy God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed. Here it is again, speedily. On him, whether it be unto death or the banishment or to confiscation of goods or to imprisonment. He's, he's making Ezra to be that legal authority whereby all others would be bowed to him. The setting up of magistrates and judges that was given Ezra to do that authority, that civil administration. But spiritually, according to that God-given wisdom, the wisdom of thy God that is in thy hand, to teach those who do not know him. That 
Again, it's a picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. He thanked the Father that the Father had given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life unto as many as the Father had given him. And that any that opposed the all judgment is in Christ's hand. We see that here with Ezra. Even down to death or banished, confiscation of goods or imprisoned, no one was to question his authority. And so it is with Christ. This is my beloved son, whom I well pleased, the Father said. Hear him. And so Ezra gives thanks. Look at these last two verses here. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. This is where there's a transition now from the letter to Ezra's response. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers, which hath put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to beautify the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem and hath extended mercy unto me before the king and his counselors and before all the kings, mighty princes. And I was strengthened as the hand of the Lord my God was upon me, and I gathered together out of Israel chief men to go up with me to Jerusalem. That's the work of God. Blessed be the Lord God of our fathers. Ezra knew that such a kindness on the part of this pagan king did not come from this king. <laughs> Anytime the Lord purposes that even the unconverted show kindness to any one of us, just know that's that's a mercy of the Lord. Whether it be in our workplaces or wherever it is. And uh, he says that. He gives God the glory to put such a thing as this in the king's heart. Even as God moved the heart of Darius back in Ezra chapter 6. Because we're, we're several years removed now from chapter 6, verses 1 through 12. We see that God also moved the heart here of our exertions. Isn't that true what Proverbs 21 1 says? The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord like the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he such is the God of heaven and even as Ezra was encouraged so we are encouraged it doesn't matter how evil a government or a country or whatever it is the Lord is doing his will and purpose and uh, deserving of all the glory all right let's take our hymn book and turn to number 16 I love this hymn, The Lord is King, hymn number 16. The Lord is King, lift up, lift up thy voice, sing his praise, sing his praise, all heaven and earth. Before him now rejoice, sing his praise, sing his praise. From world to world the joy shall ring, for he alone is God and King. From sky to sky his banners clean, sing his praise, sing his praise. The Lord is King, let all his worth declare. Great is he, great is he, bow to his will and trust his tender care. Great is he, great is he, nor doubt his wise decrees, nor doubt his steadfast promises. In humble faith, fall on thy knees, great is he. Praise him, the Lord is King, and bow to him ye must. God is free, God is good, the judge of all, to all is ever just. God is great, God is good, holy and true are all his ways. Let every creature shout his praise. The Lord of hosts, ancient of days, God is great, God is good, 
The Lord is King throughout his vast domain. He is all, all in all. The Lord Jehovah evermore shall reign. He is all, all in all. Through earth and heaven, one song shall ring from grateful hearts this anthem spring. Arise, ye saints, salute thy King. All thy days sing his praise. Amen. All right, we'll be dismissed. Go in the peace of the Lord. We'll look forward to next time. Lord willing.